We are now going to move over to our scientific program, and there are some really outstanding papers, starting with the, with the first one. This can be presented by Michael Failings. That is the surgical treat, that surgical treatment is effective for surg, uh, cervical spondylitic myelopathy. It's a one-year outcome of a multicenter prospective study with independent assessment in 294 patients. Michael. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the AANS and the uh, uh, AANS CNS section on disorders of the spine and peripheral nerves for the uh, honor of presenting this uh, talk. And as is indicated on the title slide, this is very much a collaborative multicenter effort, and this has been done through the auspices of the Clinical Research Network at AO Spine North America. You'll also note that um, we uh, now have closed out the study. We have 300 uh, patients, uh, six more than were indicated in the, uh, in the abstract. Cervical spondylotic myelopathy is by far the largest um, contributor to spinal cord impairment in the world. It's also the most treatable. And yet, remarkably, there's a paucity of empirical information in the form of high-quality prospective studies with validated outcome measures. As a result, we have a disconnect in the literature where we have a commonly performed procedure, and yet there actually is a relative lack of validated evidence to support this. So to address this um, uh, significant deficiency in the literature, we elected to perform a, a multicenter prospective uh, cohort control study. 300 patients with clinically confirmed cervical myelopathy based on uh, clinical criteria and imaging documentation were enrolled in this study. Patients underwent anterior surgery or posterior surgery uh, using techniques uh, at the discretion of the operative team. So surgeons were allowed to perform the techniques that they're familiar with and are good at. Um, uh, here are the demographics and the uh, techniques used in this trial. 300 subjects enrolled in 13 sites. We used a, a variety of validated generic and disease-specific outcome uh, measures, uh, including the MGOA and other uh, measures. Importantly, we used a very rigorous classification of myelopathy dis distinguished between, between mild, moderate, and uh, severe. Other studies in the literature have defined mild myelopathy as patients having an MJOA of, um, with a cutoff at 12, and we really felt that that um, uh, underrepresented uh, the mild population, and we actually used a more rigorous cutoff at uh, 15. So if anything, we were actually um, biasing the study against finding a treatment effect in the mild myelopathy patients. We had 82.4% of follow-up out of 286 eligible subjects, 14 subjects uh, elected to drop out of the study, and the remaining uh, data were, um, were derived using a technique called multiple imputation methodology, as is shown here. And then we use multiple regression statistical models using multivariate approaches to compensate for any potential uh, biases related to any uh, uh, of the uh, covariates. So the first thing to point out here in the baseline demographics is that there are important differences in who we're treating with anterior and posterior techniques. So how many uh, articles have we seen in the literature comparing anterior versus posterior? So the first thing, ladies and gentlemen, this is like comparing apples and oranges. Here's who we're treating with anterior techniques. These patients are a decade younger. They have less impairment on the MJOA and on the NURIC and they have far fewer levels treated. And that's no surprise. Patients with one or two level disease, we're treating those patients anteriorly. Types of patients we're treating posteriorly are older, they have many more levels of involvement, and they have much more severe impairment. And then there are very uh, uh, rare patients that with a, a significant instability and complex uh, patterns of involvement that are undergoing uh, so-called 360 surgery. So I'm going to walk you through these graphs. These are not means and standard errors or standard deviations. These are 95% confidence intervals. So you can readily see that there are very significant uh, differences here in terms of the baseline stratification. This really validates the methodology that we have used to define mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, the patients uh, in all three groups, severe, moderate, and mild, show statistically significant improvements with surgical outcome. This is the first time that this has ever been documented that uh, surgery results in significant improvement in patients with mild myelopathy. Secondly, we find uh, a reduction in disability. So here, uh, higher scores reflect increased disability. Lower scores represent improved outcomes. Again, we see significantly improved outcomes. 
for mild, moderate, and severe myelopathy with surgical treatment. Again, with the NURIC score, this is heavily weighted toward a walking. These all improve, and this slight apparent worsening is actually uh, not statistically uh, significant. This is, an, this is an important outcome here. So firstly, the SF36 PCS scores, you'll see the marked degree of improvement in patients with mild myelopathy. So we actually underrepresent as clinicians the degree of impairment that these patients uh, sustain. These are actually very large improvements in the SF36. And importantly here, although patients with severe myelopathy improve with regard to the NURIC and MJOA scores, they'll actually tell you that they have significant residual impairment, and I would argue that we're actually missing the treatment window in these patients. Uh, cervical myelopathy also has marked uh, impact on patients' quality of life as, effect, as reflected by the mental component scores of the SF36, and this is also significantly improved with surgical outcome. Now I'm going to demonstrate the data in tabular form with one graph, and basically what this is just showing are the various covariates that can influence, for example, the MGOA score. And you have to take these into consideration, the multivariate analyses that I demonstrated before. So basically, the MGOA is highly uh, dependent on the, on the baseline uh, uh, scores, similarly with the neck disability index. But importantly here, if you look at the NUREC score, this is also highly dependent on symptom duration. So let me show the, what this means graphically. What this means, and this is also the first time that this has been shown, is that the duration of symptoms is an important predictor of the outcome with surgery. These patients are not stable. Um, all of the patients in each one of these uh, cohorts improved with surgery, but the patients with the best outcomes had patients with briefer duration of uh, symptomatology. And here again with the SF36, we see uh, significant uh, dependency on how patients do at baseline. So the bottom line is, is the earlier you pick up this problem, the earlier you treat the patients, the better the outcome is going to be. And again, we see the same thing on the SF36 mental component scores. So the predictors uh, here that are emerging include general health status, social status variables, neurological status, and the duration of symptoms. Importantly, the type of surgery, anterior or posterior, really had no impact on the, uh, on the impact of uh, treatment. And this is because anterior surgery was used in patients such as this one here, patient with two-level uh, pathology treated with an, a two-level ACDF. And posterior surgery is used in patients like this, multiple-level involvement here due to OPLL and and you can argue on the type of posterior treatment here. I, I undertook a laminectomy infusion, but there was considerable agreement among investigators that this patient would be treated with posterior techniques. So the take-home points here is that the duration of symptoms is negatively associated with the extent of neurological recovery. All subsets of patients, mild, moderate, and severe, improve with surgical intervention. However, patients with severe myelopathy are left with, with residual uh, impairment, suggesting that there is a critical time window when interventional uh, treatments will have an impact. Again, I'd like to thank all of uh, my co-investigators and the support from AO Spine North America. Thank you very much. We actually have about two or three minutes if, we'd like, if anybody would like to ask Dr. Failings a question regarding this, I think, very fascinating study. Are there, please, come up to the microphone. Ian Johnson, uh, this is working. Sure. Um, I have a question about, uh, but when you're talking to these patients, um, what percentages do you quote to them on, on who's going to get better? I mean, I understand the, the time frame, but they ask, am I going to get better? So, yeah. so, let, that, yeah, so, let, so the question was, what types of statistics can we yeah. quote? And, and obviously, in the, in the time frame of this talk, I couldn't present all of the data, and we're still calling through the predictors, but let me give you some, some of, the, of the numbers. 80% of patients improve. So, so when I was a resident, I was taught to tell patients the patients don't improve, but you'll prevent them from deteriorating. You can actually now tell the patients that there's an 80% likelihood that they will improve, and you'll have a pretty good idea. If you remember that first set of curves, somebody is mild, you can, you can bet dollars for donuts that that patient is going to have a pretty good outcome. What is the risk? Neurological risk is 3%, all right? The risk of worsened spinal cord function is less than 1%. Most of that 
is a transient nerve root deficit, the most common of which is a C5 deficit. Fortunately, in our study, all of the C5 palsies resolved. They obviously don't always in the literature, but the majority do. So those are the numbers, I think, that you can kind of hang your hat on. Time for one more question. In this time where the health cost is a big issue, do you think we'll get to a point where we'll be saying to patients, you've had symptoms for so long, we're not going to be able to offer a surgery for you? No, so that's the other thing that's interesting. Uh, so so uh, although uh, patients with severe my Patients with severe myelopathy are, are left with residual impairment. They do report significant improvements in their outcomes. So, in fact, there really is no such thing that we are able to define in this group where all is lost. Now, I would imagine there probably would be that kind of a circumstance. But let's just flip it around here. All right. So, so uh, one of the most impactful operations, if you will, for public health is hip arthroplasty. The improvements in SF36 that we are demonstrating are roughly equivalent to the types of improvement that you would see with uh, a hip arthroplasty. From a public health perspective, this is the commonest cause of spinal cord impairment worldwide. This is a preventable, treatable problem with very defined small risks, so we now have that very precisely defined, and we now know that we should be operating on people with milder disease. But to answer your question, even if somebody comes into your office with a very severe myelopathy, it, it's likely that they will improve with uh, surgical treatment. Thank you, Michael.